This is the second part of the story. The link to the first part is in the description below the video and in the pinned comment. It turned out that Joan wanted a quick divorce, with the trust situation dealt with separately. She would not contest the grounds of infidelity, believing that going this route would shorten the time for the divorce to be granted since she was already remarried. I told them to proceed, and Barbara said I was making the right move. She mentioned she was done measuring, and that we needed to discuss material options and pricing. Why? I asked. Because this town is growing, and it won't be long before other homes are built that may allow them a direct view into yours. Also, finishing off the house will add value. For the next four hours, we discussed each room and ordered the items online. After spending a considerable amount, I asked her if she expected me to hang them when they arrived. And she said yes, that's a man's job, but she would help. She figured she better check in with Judy. And we were glad she did. Judy had inside knowledge about what they found in the coffin, wrapped and taped in bubble wrap for protection, was a sealed envelope. Once it was open, it contained a note saying, Next time, James and Joan, when you try to harm someone, make sure the person you hired is competent. It was signed by me. When I heard that, I couldn't help but laugh. When Barbara got off the phone, she asked for an explanation, so I told her that before I left to report, the judge had me sign a bunch of blank pages as if I was signing the letter. What they found must have been one of those. Barbara was just about to start dinner when I got a call letting me know all my friends and their spouses were on their way to welcome her to the neighborhood. I told her not to bother starting anything, because we were about to have a house full. They wanted to welcome Barbara to our village in group. Apparently, Connie had spread the word that I had brought a classy lady back with me, and my daughters had approved. All the ladies wanted to meet the woman who had caught my attention. They joked all night that they had to see it to believe it. Charlie had finally found a girlfriend. Within ten minutes, the group arrived, and I proudly introduced Barbara to everyone. We were having a potluck dinner, country-style fried chicken, baked beans, nachos and cheese, potato chips, fries, coleslaw, fresh buns, two cases of beer, and pecan pie. All the ladies loved Barbara's selection of dishes. After introductions, she quickly fit in, discussing the curtains, blinds, and rods she had ordered, saying they should arrive on Friday. It was decided that Saturday afternoon we would all get together to put them up, but she insisted they bring nothing because she would prepare a meal for us all. Early Thursday morning, we went to a superstore in Port. Barbara wanted a large propane barbecue, a deep fryer, and a smoker with the necessary tanks. We ended up buying a patio set that would seat eight, with eight extra chairs, and arranged for delivery the next day. I bought pre-cut lumber to build a couple of tables. Friday morning, I started building her an outdoor cedar table that, when collapsed, would stand against the back wall, but would be used as the main counter for serving food when pulled out. I stained it to match the wood of our log home and protected it in the same way. She loved it. Thank goodness Ace Hardware pre-assembled it. It saved a lot of time. Saturday at noon, they brought their ladders, and the five of us guys soon had the curtains set up in all the rooms. We let the ladies hang them. I had to admit in front of them, all that Barbara had a great sense of design and style, which made her smile. What we had done made the house look that much better, and I acknowledged it. I laughed because Barbara blushed. Bill pointed out that I was going to need a garage and a storage room for the patio items before the winter weather set in. I had to agree, but if I was going to do it right, I wanted a protected pathway with a mudroom for coats and boots, all made with logs. Barbara said we needed room for two freezers. I groaned, and Connie caught it, saying, Are you already planning for more kids? I blushed, and everyone laughed. Poor Charlie. He's already henpecked, and doesn't know it, Connie joked, and everyone roared again. Barbara had smoked and slow-cooked twenty pounds of ribs, made a huge potato salad, and prepared a quick shredded pickled cabbage relish and a regular salad. It was a hit with everyone, so all the ladies had to find out how the cabbage was made. 
To reward her for all her hard work, I made her breakfast on Sunday. Then, with friends, we took a cruise up the coast. Seeing her enjoyment in what we were doing, I made a note to take her to Seattle for some whale watching and to spend a day at the market. When Judy called Barbara, she privately admitted that she was in love. I felt the same, but I wouldn't make a move. I was too old and saw myself as too set in my ways. It had been an interesting week. We had over three evenings designed and laid out the plans, and my four best friends enjoyed teasing me about being in love. No matter how hard I argued, they knew I was in a challenging position. The rock removal company would be coming next week to start leveling the additional space. By the time they were finished, we would have county approval for a four-bay garage, a built-in storage area in the back with an in-law apartment on top, and a 16-foot walkway leading to the large mudroom. James and Joan had been called into the FBI. Rumors suggested it wasn't going well. The investigation had narrowed down to two possible suspects who may have been hired to carry out the plan against me. It was difficult for them because of the lack of concrete evidence, and both were under scrutiny. On Friday, I received an interesting phone call from the president of the company I had founded. He wanted to know, as a major shareholder, if I would be interested in becoming the new CEO. I asked if I could have a week to think about it, and he agreed. Somehow, the news leaked out, causing the shares to rally, rising to $139. Then, late Saturday, a very loud thunderstorm rolled in. I didn't realize it, but it would change our relationship forever. The storm hit in the middle of the night while I was lying in bed, listening to the heavy rain on the metal roof. Suddenly, my bedroom door opened just as a huge flash of lightning illuminated the room. Barbara walked in, wearing a slim, almost sheer nightgown that barely covered her. She was a sight to behold, her silhouette framed by the lightning. I pretended to be asleep as she pulled the sheets back and crawled in beside me. Her body trembled in fright, with the next thunderclap echoing off the walls. She pressed tightly against me. I could smell the sweet scent of fresh soap from her shower, with hints of lavender filling the air. The closeness was overwhelming. Turning sideways, she slid her leg over mine, wrapped her arm around my chest, and laid her head on my shoulder. I hadn't been this close to a woman in years, and I was a nervous wreck. As she raised her head to kiss my cheek, I turned toward her, and our lips met. A gentle kiss turned into a slow, lingering exchange. Fueled by our emotions, it became a night of wonders and whispers, as we made up for lost time. It wasn't just a physical connection. We were truly making love. In the afterglow, we admitted our feelings for each other. It was almost 10 a.m. when hunger finally compelled us to get out of bed. I went down to brew some coffee, dressed only in my pajama bottoms. While waiting for it to brew, I called my daughter Judy. Dad! Judy exclaimed, surprised. It's good to hear your voice. I have to ask you something. What did Bard say to you during Jin's wedding? I replied that the moment she saw you in the wedding party, it was love at first sight. The more she learned about you that night, the more she felt her feelings were real. She watched you all night, and ever since your return home, she's been on cloud nine. Whatever you plan to do, don't hurt her, Judy said, concerned. I chuckled and said, just between us, she slept in my bed last night, and this morning we admitted we're in love. Judy got emotional, so I told her I would let her go and talk to her later. The coffee was almost ready, so I cleaned the French press and warmed our cups. Just as I finished, the doorbell rang. It was FedEx with a special delivery for my lawyer, my divorce certificate. The court had waived the waiting period due to extenuating circumstances. I was officially free. Barbara was coming downstairs, her face glowing with happiness. Her cell phone rang, and she answered. Within seconds, she burst out laughing. After a moment, she ended the call. That was Judy, she said. She had a question for you. Oh, and what was that? I asked. She asked if it was okay if she started calling me mom, Barbara replied, giving me another kiss. You just had to tell her, didn't you? I laughed. 
Barbara said, I had to make the first move because you never would. She was right. I had seen myself as too old to fall in love again. I poured us both our morning coffee and walked over to the kitchen table. After mixing mine the way I liked it, I grabbed Barbara's cup as she headed toward me. When she saw the letter from my lawyer, she picked it up and read it. The second page was the certificate. She looked at me, tears of joy in her eyes. I got up and held her in my arms. Is it time for you to meet my parents? She asked. When I said yes, she called her mother to ask if they still did family gatherings on the family farm during Labor Day weekend. When she said yes, she told her that she would be coming home for it, and her mother was thrilled. Instead of having it on Monday, she explained that they would be gathering on Saturday because others had plans for that Monday. Judy and Joan were both out before the end of summer, and we spent one day going through their binders. Both daughters and Barb were surprised by how much I had documented about their lives. We flew into Kioga County Airport, where we had a rental car waiting. After settling our luggage, we booked ourselves into a Holiday Inn. It was a beautiful September day, and the plane was scheduled to pick us up the following Tuesday. Barb hadn't been home in two years, but she warned me that both her father and two brothers had served in the military, and since I was the first man in her adult life she was bringing home, I would surely be put to the test to see if I was good enough for their only daughter. The next morning, she drove us to the farm. We arrived early, and I figured this because we were the third vehicle in the yard. Her mother rushed out of the house to greet us before we even turned off the car, clearly shocked that her only daughter was with a man. Hearing the commotion, her father came out to see what the fuss was about, and I was taken aback to find out that her father was Bullfrog Patterson, my old drill sergeant. The first words out of his mouth were, Well, I thought like all the new recruits that he was just a troublemaker. Barb, what are you doing with this guy? He laughed, holding his hand out to me. He cost me over a thousand bucks. I was supposed to break him and get him to drop out, but instead, he excelled despite me. He became one of the best Marines I've ever trained. I couldn't help but smile. Bullfrog, I said, as Barb and her mom looked at me in surprise. I wanted to have a serious talk with Barb or her father because I wanted to ask for his daughter's hand. I had no clue he would react that way. Are you serious? Mrs. Patterson asked. Yes, ma'am, I replied firmly, noticing Bullfrog's smile grow wider. You've got it. John is my only reply, he said. My only daughter couldn't come home with a better man. With that, I got down on one knee, pulled the ring box out of my pocket in front of her parents, and asked Bard to marry me. Completely surprised, she said yes. I stood up and slid the ring on, praying it would fit. It did. Then I gave her a big kiss. After a round of congratulations and warm welcomes from her parents, her mom said, let me grab the keys to the truck, and we'll do a quick run for beer. It'll give us a chance to talk. Barb's mom was emotional for two reasons. Her daughter had come home with a man her father approved of and had gotten engaged right on the spot. Our first stop was the local legion for a couple of drafts. Bullfrog asked if I had finalized my divorce, and I confirmed that I had. I explained how I had met his daughter and how our relationship developed. He knew I came from a good background, so he didn't need to pry. He introduced me to everyone proudly as his future son-in-law. Someone asked how he got the nickname Bullfrog. I explained he was our drill sergeant for basic training, and it was his job to weed us out. Since I joined at the age of 16 with my parents' approval, he felt I really didn't want to be there. He came down on me hard. Every little mistake meant extra punishment. One night in the barracks, one of the guys said, Man, you're really in for it. What do you think of him? I replied, He reminds me of a bullfrog sitting on a log trying to catch bugs. The problem is, in his eyes, I'm the bug. The guys loved it, and it stuck. We spent a couple of hundred picking up beer and rye. I knew Bullfrog would make sure I was so intoxicated by the end of the day that I wouldn't be able to drive. By the time we got back, the yard was full of cars. We took some of the beer and rye to the house, 
then drove Bullfrog's truck around to park it for easy access. As we arrived, Barb and her mom greeted us. Just then, a voice in the crowd yelled, Son of a hard hat. Charlie, is that you? I looked up to see Misley Mike. Old dog, how in the hell are you? It's good to see you, brother. Within seconds, we were giving each other a big brotherly hug, knowing we were still good friends. Volfrog looked at us and said, You know each other. He's the best tech I ever had working under me. I replied with a big grin. Volfrog asked, Why did he call you Hard Hat Charlie? When I re-enlisted, I started using my second name and made it to Major before I was discharged, I explained. I got that name from my SEAL team during what would end up being my last mission. So, you're the Charlie who saved my son's life, Bullfrog said. We both nodded in agreement. Bard walked up, stood beside me, and whistled to get everyone's attention. She introduced me to everyone as her boyfriend, and then said, My mother has something to say before we continue with the party. Turning to me, she whispered, I'm keeping the keys because if I know my dad and brother, you're going to be too intoxicated to drive. Bard's mom, Gloria, spoke up. I wish to officially announce the engagement of my only daughter, Barbara, to retired Major Jonathan Charles Barnes. She came home because Jonathan wanted our approval before he asked our daughter. My husband trained him and said he was one of the best he ever had. It took him no more than twenty seconds to give his blessing. As soon as he got it, he got down and proposed right in front of us. Everybody seemed stunned, but Mike said, You're going to be my brother-in-law, repeating it as if he was trying to convince himself it was true. For the next hour, Barb introduced me to her extended family. She admitted it had been a long time since she had seen her family look so proud. And she was right, they definitely got me drunk. I had no idea how we made it back to the hotel. I couldn't remember half the night. I had to ask my future wife if I had made a fool of myself. She summed it up by saying, you outlasted the other two guys. As I struggled to get out of bed, I felt rough. Barb said it served me right, and I swore to myself it would be the last time. During breakfast, Barb whimsically took a picture of her ring with her cell phone and texted Judy, sending her the photo as an attachment. She texted, you can call me mom if you agree to be my maid of honor. Less than ten minutes later, we were on a conference call with my three very excited daughters. They were all thrilled. We learned that James and Joan were dealing with the FBI on multiple levels and facing various possible charges. Their defense bills were climbing, and both of their careers were in jeopardy. James had DNA tests done on his three sons and found that they were all his. I guess all he was going through had created doubts in his own mind. It looked like their marriage was strained to its limit, and my three daughters felt it would be lucky to last another year. The money that funded it all had been traced back to James, who had it paid for through the trust, given legal authority to him after my fake death by Joan. It proved that their plans had started long before I caught them. Little did we know that in his warped mind, everything happening to him was my fault and he still claimed he was being framed. Most thought he had lost all credibility. My trust, which had still not been settled, was now worth millions, and the lawyers would be fighting over it for months. I told them the court had put it into the hands of a trustee until the settlement came. The only problem we faced right now was that my three daughters wanted us to fly to New York for a family celebration. We agreed to come as soon as Bard's work schedule allowed it, all the girls were pushing for a date. I worked it out with the board, with my future bride's approval, to accept the position of CEO. Meetings would be held on the second and fourth Friday of each month, with secure conference calls three days a week. I wanted to limit my time away from Barb. She had become my world. Barb started her first day at the hospital and soon fit right in. Working in the ER in a small town allowed a lot of free time so she began taking courses to further her career. She worked four 12-hour days one week and three the next. Her hours were from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., so I made sure to have meals ready by the time she came home. 
Our friends got a kick out of how domesticated I was becoming. It made me wonder if they had ever had a clue about a bachelor's life. After her first three weeks, we flew out that Thursday night to New York so I could attend a press conference the following morning to announce my new position on the board. It was after that media event that I learned the court had ruled that all the changes made to my trust after the report of my false death were made illegally. The court ruled that I would have to pay James and Joan 19% of its current value, and if they wanted any of the personal property, they would have to buy it back at market value if I agreed to sell it. It was a huge blow for them. I instructed my lawyers to work out the details of the split, providing they got to keep their family home. After the conference, Barb and I went back to my parents' house, where we learned my three daughters and Stephen would be joining us on Saturday. Mom and Dad wanted to give their own version of a welcome to the family. Although she had the staff, Barb cooked the meals. We had one big problem to solve, where we would get married, and how we could satisfy our friends and family. By the end of the day, with my parents' help, we decided to get married in Ohio and have a second reception back here with family and their friends, along with a gathering with the crew back home. After everything was settled, I would ask Bard's brother, Misley Mike, to be my best man. Judy was Bard's maid of honor, and Jen and Joe would be the ladies-in-waiting. Stephen and her other brother would round out the wedding party. We set the date for the last Saturday in December because it had always been Bard's wish to be a December bride. We had just finished a delicious family dinner made by my mom when there was a knock at the front door. When my dad returned from answering it, we were surprised to find my former wife asking to talk to me. My gut told me no way, and so did my parents. Barb said, you must forgive her before you can be free from the past. Connie told me about her actions and how your wisdom won them both over. It's time you applied your own wisdom to yourself. I went to Dad's office for a few moments before calling Joan. Joan, I said, before we begin, I want you to hear the last words I heard from you years ago. I was sitting in the judge's office when he spoke to you. Pay attention to the tone of your voice and what you said back then. Just so you know, I just emailed a statement to CNN confirming that I was there when the judge recorded it, and I listened to the conversation via speakers while you two were talking. Joan's face went pale. She now understood that I knew the whole truth. The mass media had never played the entire conversation. I excused myself to give a strong drink so she could have the privacy to hear her own words as I remembered them that fateful day. I returned with a scotch and water listening outside the door until the conversation between the judge and her was finished before going back into Dad's office. Imagine if you can that conversation from my side, as I listen to you deliberately write me out of my daughter's lives. Try to see it from my perspective, the cheating, the hurt, the pain, and the tears. Consider the price we all had to pay because you became my older brother's high-class partner. I have asked many times what James did during the three years he lived with us besides betraying me behind my back. What was it you famously told our daughter, that the story about their dad's death was sad but true? But we can be thankful because it brought Uncle James to all of you. I said this coldly with a firm voice. Did you ever say anything in our relationship that was 100% true? Jennifer, Judy, and Joe have all heard the same thing. They have even seen the date it was recorded and know it was before my reported death. The result is that they are now questioning everything James and you ever said to them. Listening to that tape has forever destroyed any trust they had in both of you. I told her, time appears to have proven that I was nothing more to James and you than a tool for you to use for your own ends. When Jennifer found me, I knew I could not be the walking dead anymore. It was time for me to reclaim my name my family, and my life. The family secrets had to end. I stated this firmly. Joan looked shell-shocked. My words had struck her like arrows of steel. Tears were now flowing like a gentle spring rain. I had to wonder if it was caused by remorse or the shame of being caught. I got up from behind my dad's desk, handing her a box of tissues. Taking my drink in my hand, I left, saying I would give her time to gather her thoughts. Barb and my parents were in the living room when I walked in. 
My mom was showing Barb all the photos she had collected over the years. By the looks on her face, it's not going well, my father said. Well, she heard her own words to the judge in his response. Before I gave her a chance to speak, I told her to imagine how I must have felt considering I was listening to the conversation on his speakerphone at the time. I asked her a few questions and she lost it, so I'm giving her time to collect her thoughts before we talk. I told her that her daughters had heard it all too and saw that the conversation had taken place days before my reported death. I pointed out that her own words had destroyed any trust her daughters had in both of them. I came out because I did not want to watch her tears. Are you okay? Barb asked me with genuine concern. Just stating the facts, I said. It has given me an inner peace I have not felt in a long time. The rage, the anger I once had is gone. I can now accept whatever comes. It looked like Barb was right. Then, after refilling my drink, I walked back into the office and sat down, lighting a cigarette while I waited for her to begin. We saw you catching us as the brass ring. Finally, we would get what we had always dreamed of, the chance to live our lives beyond closed doors. When the judge called, James was in the kitchen with me. We both saw him interfering in what was not his business. His anger and rage drove my thoughts and my response. I really hadn't given my comments much thought, Joan said softly. You know the judge was right. Your father had been texted the video I took before the judge called him. Your father asked us to do nothing until he got there. Within the hour, he was in his plane flying down. When he heard the conversation, he himself went into shock. They both felt, as I did, that you had set everyone up. If it came out, their careers would be over and their reputations damaged beyond repair. When Jennifer heard it, she demanded we get our DNA tested to verify that what we believed was true. Thankfully, she was my biological daughter. Both would have reacted strongly if it had been different, I replied. Your comments made it clear that everything you two were doing was deliberate. Now you know why. To this day, your own father has had little to do with you. He told the whole family when he went home what had to be done, and why. The question I have is, what gave you the right to write me out of our children's lives? I have to ask because our daughters want to know. I stood up because her tears were starting to flow again and walked out. What are your thoughts so far? Barb asked. She's trying to justify her actions. Nothing more, nothing less. She has shown no remorse and hasn't apologized. I feel the only thing she is sorry for is the fact that it has all come out. I said. Just looking at the three of them told me all I needed to know. They were as shocked as I was. We were all trying to figure out why she had come. We were both looking at doing time, Joan said when I came back into the room. The FBI has us on charges of lying to them. At least tax evasion, faking a death, theft, and a couple more, all involving your trust. Our lawyers are trying to work out a plea deal as we speak before we're officially charged. James and I both feel if you spoke up, they might not be as harsh. Sadly, to this point, they have not asked me a word. Why would they? I was in the forces overseas fighting for our freedom while others play their games, I said with a smile on my face. I really can't help you, can I? You made your bed, you lie in it. This is James and your mess. I have often asked myself if you were ever really in love with me. I now know you weren't. I guess you'll finally learn the hard way that there are consequences for your actions that money can't buy you out of. You haven't changed. I had hoped for you to apologize for what you had done, but you didn't. You came to try to save your own skin. It's always been about you and what you wanted, so please allow me the pleasure of escorting you out. I guess you'll both end up claiming it's not your fault. I could not stop laughing as she left the house. Mom and Dad were being just that. Barb and I had to sleep in separate beds, which made me realize just how attached Barb and I had become. There is nothing like the warmth of a body next to you in the middle of the night from a loved one that can calm a troubled soul. It was a night of tossing and turning, making me appreciate how much we had become one. It was about two when Barb sneaked into my room. When she said, I couldn't sleep without you, 
It brought a smile to my face. I responded, It's moments like this that make us feel young. As she climbed in beside me, I drew her into my arms. When she saw the tears in my eyes, she had to ask me why. I responded, I finally understood what it meant to have a loving wife. It became a memory we would share and cherish for the rest of our lives. I guess my words hit home because Barb started to cry. I calmed her down with gentle kisses. I need to know right now, she asked. How do you feel about us having kids? I paused before speaking, then said, Kids have a unique way of keeping the old young at heart. If you can accept the fact that I will be in my sixties before the last of our brood is out of the house, I see no problem if we have more than one. I guess it's time we started working on one, she said, and we did. Dad was already up when I went down. The whole bottom floor had the smell of fresh coffee in the air, bringing back memories of my childhood. It had always been his routine to brew coffee when he was off. I had to agree. Coffee made like that was richer and more flavorful than today's drip stuff. Good morning, Dad said as I walked in to get a cup and join him at the table. I want to thank Bard and you for ruining a good night's sleep. What was my reply? Your mom had to wake me up when Barb slipped into your room to ask me what I thought we should do. He laughed. I told her that you were both old enough to know what you were doing. I'm going to enjoy teasing her about it for weeks. Tell mom that Barb and I really don't sleep well when we're apart. We learned that thanks to her last night, I replied, and let her know we were planning for her to have a couple more grandkids within a couple of years. Barb wants them close because of her age. Dad commented, I guess we will be looking for a home in SPM with me semi-retiring. Your mother will want to spend a lot of time being a grandmother again. Jennifer and Steve were the first to show up. Barb and I hadn't seen them since their wedding, and it gave us a chance to catch up. They were both thrilled to be part of our bridal party and told us about what they did on their honeymoon. Barb explained what happened when I met her parents making sure to mention that I was quite cheerful during that encounter, then playfully embarrassed me by showing them a video clip of her father, her brother, and I singing a song. The girls roared with laughter at that one. Even my dad cracked a smile. Steve found it amusing that Barb's dad had been my drill surgeon and her brother one of my trainees. Judy and Joan showed up about an hour later. Judy was overjoyed when Barb asked her to be our maid of honor. Until then, she hadn't taken it seriously. They spent quite a while catching up on all the gossip from where she used to work and their mutual friends. Mom had to brag with joy about our plans to have children, and of course, Jennifer had to tell her sisters about my infamous video, which led to plenty of teasing on my part. Steve got Barb to send him a copy so he could forward it to his dad. Barb mentioned that with the building of the addition and her new job, we had been so busy we hadn't seen them since the first of the month. It should be finished by the end of the month. She explained that it was a four-bay garage with a huge separate storage section behind it and a three-bedroom apartment above. We have a fully enclosed walkway to the mudroom that will be attached to the house. It took them a week to level off the area before they could build. At the same time, we doubled the size of our leveled backyard and enlarged the patio hoping to have it stained and sealed to match the house if the weather holds out. The excess soil and rock we removed were used to expand the level area in the front. It was then that I broke the news to my daughters that I had talked to their mother the night before. They all became quiet. Using Dad's internet and Bard's laptop, I played the audio clip of our chat through Dad's TV. I watched as they listened intently to the judges and Joan, then to my conversation with her afterward. I could tell my daughters were stunned. I don't believe it. There was no explanation, no guilt or remorse. Yet she came expecting you to help them out because she felt you owed them, Joan said. You asked her questions, which she completely ignored. It's sad that she's so self-centered that she cannot see what her own actions have done. Dad, Joan said, in her world, it appears that it is all about her. Was she always like that? I thought for a moment before replying. Before the birth of the three of you, I would have to say no. I remember my first leave home after your birth. 
Even though I was only home for three months, I could tell that something about her had changed. I wrote it off at first as her being overstressed, tired, and worn out because the three of you were a handful at times. That was when I hired your first full-time nanny and decided to leave the army so I could be home to help her with you all. By the time I got out, you were almost three. We were strangers to each other, but soon she started to warm up. Now I see that for her, it was all a front. During that year, James had moved in and had gotten a job. He started his civilian life, and with Dad's help, I started building my company. I guess my relationship with her during that time was just a facade she had behind as she built her future with him. That is why I asked her if she had ever been truthful to me. Honestly, it sounds like she had a mental breakdown caused by extreme depression after your births that she never sought help for, Judy said. Both Barb and I have seen that quite often in her line of work. One of the classic symptoms is a personality change. It's a way the mind helps them cope. That may explain what happened, but not her actions. Sadly, after all that has been done, this is the final straw. My mother and her two sisters agreed. I thought, this is just something else she can blame me for. I didn't know at that time how accurate that would turn out to be. To change the mood, Barb decided to get the ladies to help her choose the color of their dresses. I chimed in, saying I would be wearing black. When I was asked why, I said because black is the color for those grieving a loss. Jennifer had to ask what I would be losing. I replied, my freedom, which got a big groan. My dad saw me grab a beer and head outside to sort out my thoughts. He knew I had a lot on my mind, so he joined me. Son, I know it's hard to face. Don't try to second-guess yourself and what you did. You made the best decisions for all of us at that time based on what you knew. There's no good in looking back. Life is just too short. Count your blessings. Three beautiful daughters who make their grandfather very proud. They carry your morals, principles, and standards well. A future wife who has a heart of gold. My father and mother split their estate between me and you while sidelining James. You serve your country and save many lives. You took the high road always in your walk in life. Even though you lost it all for a while, today you stand tall and proud, free to live your life as you see fit, he explained. Your daughters just wrote their mother out of their lives. They made hard choices just like you. My dad said wisely, with the same knowledge that should tell you that what you did was not wrong. It was your actions and your actions alone that brought your daughters home. They understand that regardless of the cost, you did what you did for the benefit of us all. That says it all. My dad always had a way of making me feel proud. His insightful words seemed to clear the fog in my mind, allowing me to have a clearer vision. Just think, you may end up with grandchildren older than their uncles and aunts. He added with a laugh. Not many get a second chance to do it better the second time. Focus on what's coming and leave the past behind. With a smile on my face, we walked back in and joined the rest of the family as they continued planning my wedding. Barb, my mom, and my three daughters were now discussing what type of flowers to choose, whether it would be a church service or just a civil ceremony, and if there would be a Christmas theme. I shook my head, so Dad, and I spent the rest of the afternoon playing crib for a penny a point, doubling the stakes for special circumstances. I ended up losing four dollars, and sixty-five cents. Let them handle it, he said, and just show up at the wedding. It's the easiest way to stay out of trouble. He was right. On Sunday, before we left, my mother had Barb call her mother to inform her that we would be getting married, and she was thrilled. Barb also made it clear that her future mother-in-law wanted to be involved in the planning. Dad overheard my mom on the phone say, Don't worry about the cost. It's my husband, and I's wedding gift to these two, and he rolled his eyes. The two mothers argued about it, but my mother put her foot down, and that was that. Ever since her teenage years, her close female friends had always called her Sarge. They did agree that everything had to be approved by Barb, which reinforced in my mind that I was marrying my mom's replica because Barb was the same way. 
The way things were coming together made me question whether Joan and I had truly been in love. As we flew home, Bart mentioned her parents were flying out. Mom wanted to discuss locations, menu options, which band to hire, and whatever else she could think of to complicate matters further. They wanted to see what kind of life we led daily. We didn't even have to pick them up. Barb's dad was renting a truck so they could do day trips from our house while they toured the island. It was something he had always wanted to do, and now they had the chance. With just over two months until the wedding, time was catching up to us quickly. We returned home to find that the dive had burned down. So Tuesday morning found me sitting with the owner, who had no insurance and was not going to rebuild. I offered him fair market value for the property, and we negotiated the liquor license until we worked out a deal, provided the local council would approve it. Within three days, the mayor granted the approval, and by the end of the week, they began construction on the site. The contractors and builders were excited. They were constructing a back-to-back -back restaurant and bar that would take up a city block, using in part more logs from the mill and a concrete floor, with the two businesses sharing a common interior wall. Everyone was impressed, and using plans approved by the village, they said they would have the outside completed in two weeks. Former staff agreed to work in the bar, and were thrilled by its new name, Bullfrogs. Using the nearest real estate agent, we had the restaurant space leased before they were done. I hired a firm out of Seattle to design the layout of the bar and to set it up. I paid extra for a rush job. I got Barb to have her mother skin her favorite picture of Barb in uniform and email it to us. I used that image to have a glass company design the main entrance doors with her full image etched on each door, along with the bar's name displayed prominently. Barb had ordered the furniture for the new apartment, and during the month, she and our moms had pretty much settled everything about the wedding. The day before her parents arrived, everything was done. That Thursday night, the new bar had its grand opening, which was more successful than the old one had ever been. Everyone raved about our bar food menu, which made Barb smile because she had planned out the items, giving them unique names. We had 31 days until the wedding. Barb's parents would arrive around 5 that Friday night, so I was surprised to find out that morning that Barb wanted me to drive her over to the regional airport in Port, insisting we take the jeep. We had to be there at 2. I asked her why, and she said it was a surprise. We arrived at the airport at 10 to 2 in the afternoon and watched a small six-seater jet fly in. I learned something new. My dad flew his own plane. They both looked great. We had gotten my parents settled in and were sharing beers when Barb's parents arrived. After getting them settled, it was too late to start dinner, so we drove them down to our new bar. I took Barb's parents in my old Ford truck and let them drive. My future mother-in-law said my truck reminded her of the one her husband had when they were first dating. Barb followed us in the Jeep, which had become her pride and joy. When we arrived at the bar, Bull was completely surprised to see his full image on the main doors, twice. It blew him away. My dad, standing beside me, whispered softly, Well done. I said to Bull, When you walk in, I want you to give the order like you did when you wanted us recruits in formation. He agreed to humor me. As he walked in after opening the door, he let loose with his order in a roar as if we were all standing in front of him. Sixteen former Marines quickly fell into formation and saluted him one more time. He had trained every one of them. He walked down the line and shook their hands, greeting them one by one with their full names. Gloria looked at me, her face glowing with pride, and said, You know you'll have to carry him home. I nodded and laughed. Barb kissed me and said, I love you, then told her mother that she had no idea I had named our new bar after her dad. Charlie had refused to tell me because he wanted it to be a surprise. Bull was taken aback when he saw the plaque on the wall above the bar that read, named after the toughest drill sergeant of them all, Bullfrog Patterson. We all tried Bard's menu that night and agreed the food was excellent for a bar. Dad and I had to carry Bull up the stairs to his bed. His former recruits had gotten him quite intoxicated. 
it would be discussed for weeks how much nicer he was when he wasn't in command. Bull would say for years it was the second time in his life he'd been shocked and awed. The first was when I asked for his daughter's hand. As my parents and I were relaxing in the living room, reflecting on the day's events, Gloria dropped the news that Bull was being pushed into retirement after forty years of service and was at a crossroads in his life. Mike was taking over the family farm at the end of the year, and they were planning to move into town. Bull was taking it hard. He still had too much fire in him to retire. I looked into Barb's eyes and saw her growing concern. You know Barb, I said, if he lived here, he would be the perfect choice to manage the bar. Gloria replied, but where would we live? There's not much available. Barb, with a huge smile, said, We have the in-law suite if Dad will agree to it. I should warn you, though, the thunderstorms here can be loud and wild. Her mom looked at her and said, How do you manage them? Ever since you were a small child, when we had a bad storm, you would crawl into our bed. A smile came across Barb's face as she looked at me knowingly. Charlie has helped me make them one of my favorite things, she said with a huge grin. My parents caught the inner meaning and both started to laugh. Over the next few days, as Gloria and Bull toured the island, my parents John and Silva spent their time looking for a new residence. We still hadn't disclosed our plans to Bull. Gloria wanted to see how he felt about the area before we made the official offer. The furniture finally arrived in Barb, and I were busy unpacking it and setting it all out when Barb noticed an official-looking car coming around the last curve in the driveway. We both went out to meet it. It was the FBI looking for me. They wanted to talk to me alone, but I made it clear that since I had nothing to hide from my future wife, I would prefer to talk with her present. So we found ourselves sitting at the kitchen table sharing coffee. The agent, who identified himself as Peter McCormick, had some troubling news. There had been two arrests last week. My brother James was under arrest for fraud, tax evasion, falsifying a death, attempted murder, theft, and third-degree assault on his wife. He had been denied bail. Joan had filed for divorce and was facing a bunch of charges herself, but she had been granted bail because of their kids. The problem was that an informer had come forward to disclose that James had been trying to gather information about who could be hired for a contract job and may have succeeded. They wanted my schedule and plans for the next two months while the situation was being investigated. I noticed Barb's face turn pale. They were taking this seriously because the trust had a clause that stated if I got divorced and died within six months of that date, my trust would be controlled by my former wife. Lawyers had agreed that until the trust was split and approved by the court, I could not legally change anything in it. Agents had been assigned to the area to investigate matters, and they made it clear that I could not change my daily agenda in any way. Barb and I understood they were taking the matter very seriously. After they left, we sat and discussed how we were going to break the news to my parents and what steps we could take to protect ourselves. It was the last Saturday the six of us would be together until the wedding. My parents had found a five-acre lot outside of Port and had finalized the deal. Their real estate agent had linked them to a local contractor who had agreed to build them a log home a bit bigger than ours on a four-foot crawl space. They had ordered a custom kit online, which would be delivered to the building site in three weeks, but my dad was not looking forward to heading back home. He had found the slower pace of our small-town living quite pleasant. Barb, her parents, and I were sitting in the living room while my parents were out. I asked him, Bud, how much will you be taking from the farm when you move to town? He answered, We really haven't given it much thought. Honestly, I don't like the idea of having neighbors 200 yards away. Why, Dad? Barb said, Charlie and I were wondering if you would consider moving here and managing the bar for us. You both could live in the in-law suite. The salary would start at $60,000 a year. To say he was shocked would be an understatement, but he promised to think about it. We told him to take his time and let us know when he decided. Gloria later told her daughter she thought it was a done deal because Bull was very proud of that bar. 
he just had to accept in his mind what was already in his heart. As they worked in the kitchen preparing a big dinner, they talked about what Gloria wanted to bring with her. The four of us watched them drive off heading back to Ohio. As we headed back into the house, I told my parents we needed to talk. It broke my mother's heart when I told them about the FBI's visit. She blamed herself for not raising James right. I shared the advice the judge had given me and pointed out that he had led a good life until he got involved with my former wife. Remember, Mom, you taught us to associate with those who would build us up, not take us down. It's standing by my morals and principles that you raised us with that have kept me balanced and strong. James just threw away his chance. Well, Mom and Dad, Barb said, I've got some good news that may cheer you up, but you have to promise me that you will keep it to yourselves. I looked at Bard with a puzzled expression, wondering what she had to say. My parents agreed. My doctor figures that by the time we get married, I will only have 32 weeks to go, Barb said with glee. If it's a girl, it will be Gloria Elizabeth. If it's a boy, Jonathan Charles Barnes Ivy. I thought my mother would scream. I almost fainted. So here it was, a day before my wedding. Bullfrog. Measley Mike, my dad, and all the other men in my bridal party were at the Legion sharing a few drinks after going through the rehearsal. The women were somewhere else throwing Barb a bridal party. Bull was saying goodbye to many of his friends and getting quite a bit of attention as he prepared to leave Ohio and move to Washington State to manage a bar named after him. James's plan had been foiled. The contractor for the job was caught after pleading guilty and received a hard twenty. Joan had struck a deal for time served and five years of parole by agreeing to testify against her husband. His trial would start in the new year. The trust had been settled, and Joan had put the estate she lived in with her three sons up for sale and had filed for divorce. The last two of our four children were starting kindergarten next month. Jonathan first. Gloria ten months after, and then the twins, Silva and Wilford. Bullfrog's real name was Jennifer, and Stephen had a boy and a girl. Judy married a Marine from Maine who works in a corporation under me, and Joe married Measley Mike. They opened a Bullfrog's bar near the farm. Life is better the second time around. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, Please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.